Thank you. So there's an epigraph that I'll start with. The rejected chapters have taken over. For a long time, it was as though only the most patient scholar or the recording angel himself would ever interest himself in them. Now it seems as though that angel had begun to dominate the whole story. He who is supposed to only copy it all down has joined forces with the misshapen, misfit pieces that were never meant to go into it, but at best to stay on the sidelines. So as to point up how everything else belonged together and the resulting mountain of data threatens us. That's John Ashbery from a poem, a prose poem called The System from 1972. What does it mean to come to know a period through its recordings? What does it mean to know a period through the recorded artifacts of composers and musicians who largely disdained recordings? An early impulse to write this book came from observing how listeners' understandings of experimental and avant-garde music from the 1960s change on the basis of access to recordings. Simply put, what circulates in recorded form at a given time helps to delineate a historical landscape of musical activity. But for many practitioners of experimental music from the 1960s, sound recordings register as an odd counterintuitive object of study. I encountered this firsthand when discussing the project with a number of musicians, composers, and producers who came of age in the 1960s, most of whom remain of the opinion that audio recordings are at best curiously incomplete representations of their efforts. I was born in the late 1960s, 1967, uh, and I often gravitate toward music created in that decade. Fundamental to my interest in music from this period is the challenge of understanding that part of the past that lies just beyond memory's reach. My fascination with the recent but experientially inaccessible past found its first and most enduring subject in the popular music of the 1960s. From an early age, I felt that I knew the pop music of this time through an itinerary of landmark albums and singles and through arranging these recordings on an increasingly detailed timeline. If your passion centers on pop music from the 1960s, it becomes second nature to know by date particular albums or songs or events in the careers of the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Bob Dylan or James Brown. It begins with the release date of iconic recordings. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band in the summer of 1967, Blonde on Blonde in the summer of 1966, I Can't Get No Satisfaction and Papa's Got a Brand New Bag in the summer of 1965. My own strongest, most formative experiences with culture had to do with objects set adrift, obscure recordings randomly encountered. A primary appeal of records had to do with transcending age and geography. As a teenager in Louisville, Kentucky in the early 1980s and with few opportunities to see live music that I truly cared about, I immersed myself in fanzines and punk and post-punk records pressed on tiny, often one-off labels. When you're a high school fanzine editor, it's extraordinary what shows up in your mailbox. Anarchist literature, situationist-inspired altered comics, micro-sized literary magazines, fussily handwritten broadsheets, an obsessive reportage of one local punk scene after another to the point where all of these dispatches could come to seem the stuff of fiction were you not holding a record, the potentially enlightening and potentially misleading record in your pulse-quickened hands. The objectness of the record was crucial. Chief among reasons for this is, as the British group The Fall put it, Repetition, repetition, repetition. I needed multiple listens, those toe and footholds. I needed repeated listens to decide whether Public Image Limited's death disco single, an unsettling listening experience for an adolescent, was supposed to be played at 45 or at 33 and a third RPM. I eventually recognized that death disco was intended to be played at 45, but John Lydon's brays and howls were that much more inexplicable and that much more animal, and the already dominant bass that much more satisfying when the song was dragged down to 33 and a third. Public Image Limited's single was not the only one for which I was uncertain, 
about the ostensibly correct playing speed. I needed repetition, repetition, repetition to make sense of various instructive examples of what at first blush passed as formless, unvectored noise, but which eventually resolved itself into something with memorable, recognizable details, with aural breadcrumbs and semi-secure grips suggesting musical form. If particular records created first impressions of randomness, of scattering, mystifying randomness of intent, mystifying randomness of execution, mystifying purpose in opting to send this recording out into the world, and ultimate mystification that it found its way to my mailbox, then subsequent spins, whether at the intended speed or not, helped to clear the fog and to make apparent abstruse musical patterns a hypothetical practitioner of one of the kinds of 1960s experimental music that I address in this book might say that my mistake was to press forward through repetition, endeavoring to accrue meaning. Why not leave things well enough? This individual might argue that the first listen, disorienting or not, is the experience that will always be the richest and the most true to the spirit of the work. As the improvising guitarist Derek Bailey mused, quote, if you could only play a record once, imagine the intensity you'd have to bring to the listening. Beyond repeated listening, a second attraction for me to the record was its compound multidisciplinary character. It was never only about music. The record presented itself as a medium for sound, but also a medium for text, art, design, and a general confrontation with the world. At the time, its relative cheapness to produce, as well as the existence of an engaged community of peers, ready and willing to buy the thing, made the record an expressive medium with bracing democratic potential. Most of the self-produced records that began to arrive in my mailbox in the early 1980s indeed were exceptionally multidisciplinary, by which I mean that the artist who wrote and performed the music was also likely to be the artist who started and ran the record label, wrote the press release, designed the record's artwork, perhaps folded or glued the cover, stuck the cover in a plastic sleeve, addressed the envelope, purchased and licked the stamps, and stood in line at the post office. The handwriting on the cardboard mailer announced itself as part of the self-same artistic project that included the music. My experiences are not uncommon among people of my generation for whom recordings, primarily in the material form as singles, LPs, cassettes, compact discs, have served as a widely available means of time travel as well as an introduction to geography and the found object. That's why it's always intrigued me to encounter the more extreme negative period attitudes toward recording among creators of experimental and avant-garde music in the 1960s. It's an attitude that's so different from my own and from that of so many curious, sympathetic, hungry listeners for whom seeking out new musical experiences or broadening their cultural knowledge through recorded sound has been one of the most powerful through lines in their lives. As much as I was introduced to diverse and far-flung music through records, these same records steered me toward living in larger cities and in, toward, in turn toward live performance. Suddenly the need to transcend place through recordings, as I had felt growing up in Kentucky, didn't seem as crucial. When I moved to Chicago in 1990, a number of concerts of free jazz and improvised music spun me around and thoroughly engaged my imagination. This string, string of stellar live performances vividly impressed upon me the reason so many musicians judge recordings insufficient to the task of representing their practice. And I came to understand better why an earlier generation of avant-garde musicians placed such a premium on live performance. Like many others, I was first attracted to free jazz and improvised music through some of the most abstract otherworldly recordings of Sun Ra and his orchestra. I could make very little sense of them on their first encounter. With albums such as Nothing Is and It's After the End of the World, repeated listens often had the quality of hearing this music for the first time. Cacophonous group interjections appeared as unique events. As with my first encounter with records of idiosyncratic post-punk, I found the music of Sun Ra from this period difficult to revisit mentally. I simply had to listen again 
One major difference between the two styles was that music that's largely improvised brings with it an implicit demand, per Derek Bailey, that you attend to a first listening with maximum focus, just as the musicians themselves are hearing the music for the first time while playing it. By contrast, much post-punk owes its counterintuitive quality to rough musicianship, raw editing and overdubbing, and accidents of an especially in the studio nature. Spending time at concerts of improvised music, I was excited by music that appeared to flow through its players. I understood these sounds as oscillating between the non-composed and that which is composed in real time through wordless negotiation. I loved what this music and performance did to my experience of time. It swore to never repeat. The real time aspect of improvised music, where the length or scale of the piece isn't known in advance, proved to be an invigorating counterpoint to listening to recordings of improvisations. Much of what had seemed inexplicable about improvised music on record, especially combinations of musicians in which each player exhibits a high degree of autonomy, and where certain types of sonic concatenations owe largely to chance and unforeseen collision, gradually melted away as I became more familiar with the processes by which this music was often created. There were long-standing groups and musical partnerships, and there were fleeting first time and perhaps last time encounters between musicians, as was often the case when improvisers from out of town performed with Chicago's steadily expanding pool of players. There were performances that bore the marks of high musicianship and years of dedication. And there were sometimes equally thrilling, seat of the pants, scrappy, smoke pouring out of ears, brains locking gears, failing performances by much younger players who seemed just as surprised as anyone else by the unplanned musical outcomes. There were intriguing hybrid encounters when vastly more seasoned, more confident, more versatile musicians shared the stage with bold, occasionally terrified neophytes, meetings that were all the more compelling by, vir by vir virtue of awkward musical seams and joints and odd matches displayed front and center. There were performances that used experimental systems of notation or agreed upon verbal roadmaps, and there were performances in which you could imagine that the players shunned both advanced planning and Monday morning quarterbacking. And I, I have to explain, I've been working with a French translator for a version of this book. Monday morning quarterbacking, right? American football games happen on Sunday, right? And Monday morning quarterbacking is the day after when everyone explains what they should have done, right? There's the expression hindsight is 2020, right? That you can always uh, uh, know after the fact what should have happened. That's what's meant by Monday morning quarterbacking. There were performances with both feet unmistakably in a jazz lineage. There were performances for which the operative context was the mode of improvised music pioneered more recently by players such as the British musicians Derek Bailey, Evan Parker, and Paul Lytton. And there were performances where these overlapping traditions of improvisation were extended, subverted, caught unawares by younger musicians equally conversant in experimental rock and electronic music. I'm certain that my taking part in improvised music and performance in the early 1990s was in part a reaction to purchasing a CD player and beginning to acclimate myself to living with music in digital form. The fact of becoming more cognizant of music measured in clock time made live performances of improvised music increasingly appealing. When listening at home, I suddenly had the experience of knowing the exact duration of a piece of music. Previously, I would have rounded off the time in my head if I even thought to quantify it. One of the initial consequences of the CD player was a propensity to have music playing in the background, always. The CD player was only fractionally as demanding of one's attention as the increasingly needy seeming turntable. And once you cleared the creepy hurdle of getting used to digital black, recorded silences on CD, being an altogether different creature than vinyl LP's louder, more textured silences. The reward was a greater dynamic range, the upshot of which is that it became possible to listen to more radically quiet music. 
One could listen to recordings of works by Morton Feldman and not have the troubling suspicion that there were sounds buried in an LP's grooves that the needle failed to uncover, faint attacks obscured by a brush fire of surface noise. But as listening became a more rationalized experience through digital time display and a more ambient experience through the longer uninterrupted playthroughs of quieter, more abstract music, Concerts began to make, a strong, make stronger claims on my imagination. I was ready for music in which my experience of time was more subjective and more immersive, and in which I found myself confronted with an imperative to listen deeply. I recall the shock that I first experienced upon hearing Morton Feldman's music, music and performance. At the time, I had been familiar with his music through recordings. Feldman's death in 1987 was followed by a tremendous quantity of commercially released recordings of his music, such that by the beginning of the present century, more than 40 full-length CDs of Feldman's work were in print. Digital audio. All those CDs with their broad dynamic ranges and running times upwards of 70 minutes unquestionably played a role in expanding Morton Feldman's listenership. In spite of caveats appended to recordings of his work, such as, quote, a lower volume setting will produce a more realistic sound level. I hadn't experienced Feldman's uniquely hushed music as being radically quiet. That is, until I heard Stefan Schleiermacher play one of Feldman's late piano pieces at DePaul University at the close of a program dedicated to the music of Stefan Volpe and Volpe's students. I was seated in the second row and yet I had the sensation that the individual tones from the piano were doing their damnedest to travel all that way and arriving in a state of collapse from the nearly insurmountable distance from the back of the stage. The previous works in the concert had me leaning back in my seat. The Feldman piano piece had me pitched forward, straining to listen, suddenly aware of the exact physical distance between performer and listener, aware of the space of the performance, both sonically and visually, aware of the concentration exercised by individual listeners around me, and awake to the possibilities of music with profoundly quiet dynamics. Much as I had appreciated recordings of Feldman's work, this was an encounter with his music that could only have occurred in the space of live performance and in the presence of the performer. The experience stuck with me. Persuasive arguments can be made that the current availability of an unprecedented amount of recorded music has contributed to a leveling of musical hierarchies. Records were my entree into multiple musics in Chicago. Free improvisation, jazz, country, blues, contemporary composition, electronic music, dub reggae, Javanese gamelan. But even as I was schooling myself in these forms through recordings, the thing that did more to level the hierarchies of genre than filing LPs in a genre-free alphabetical sequence was to meet, usually through the social space of the performance venue, individuals hailing from diverse musical backgrounds. This proved to be an unanticipated but truly excellent fact of the metropolis. There was value, certainly, in coming to my own conclusions that the pleasure taken in listening to, for example, avant-garde music, country, and blues can't be objectively compared. The fact of meeting skilled jazz players who loved and respected unschooled, ungainly experimental rock or experimental rock folks who had begun to grapple with contemporary composition or DJs and record store clerks with an encyclopedic knowledge of most forms or classical folks who had a passion for soul and hip hop, I might be inventing that, was the single thing that most fundamentally altered my relationship to music. I learned that there was no reason for musical life to be lived like a record store with discrete sections for rock and pop, jazz, blues, soul, hip hop, oldies and classical, and the maximum possible separation between the classical and the pop sections. <laughs>
So here's a second epigraph. And this is from an interview from 1967 between John Cage and Daniel Charles, French philosopher. Daniel Charles says, records, according to you, are nothing more than postcards. And John Cage interrupts him and says, which ruin the landscape. Most genres in experimental and avant-garde music in the 1960s were ill-suited to be represented in the form of a recording. These various activities, including indeterminate music, long duration minimalism, text scores, happenings, live electronic music, free jazz, and free improvisation, were not only predicated on being experienced in live performance, but they can also be said to have actively undermined the form of the sound recording. Music that changes with each performance such that individual realizations can't necessarily be recognized as a performance of, of a given work, indeterminate music. Music whose unbroken movements and sometimes unbroken stasis extend far beyond the 20 minute length uh, of an LP side, minimalism. Music that's probably not best served by the category of music and whose instructions take the form of intentionally ambiguous, open-ended, poetic instructions and descriptions, text scores. Music in which a circuitry diagram often assumes greater importance than a written score, live electronic music. And music that dispenses with composition altogether and in some cases is described as a, quote, non-idiomatic practice free jazz and free improvisation, how could these be adequately represented on an LP? Unlike recordings of works from most other genres of music in the 1960s, comparatively few of the recordings of experimental music that are widely and immediately accessible today, many of which have become canonical representations of the period, circulated at the time at which they were created. There simply was little in the way of infrastructure that would later emerge for producing and distributing this decidedly non-commercial work. The sparse number of releases of experimental music that appeared in the 1960s represents an altogether different landscape of musical activity from one that would be recognized by subsequent listeners with access to archival recordings. There are isolated examples of artist-directed record labels in the 1960s, notably two series of LP releases directed by John Cage's colleagues, Earl Brown, so the, the contemporary sound series was Earl Brown's series, and David Behrman, who briefly directed Columbia Records' Music of Our Time series. And there was much informed critical writing in the period, often coming from musicians and composers themselves, but there was nothing resembling the scale of contemporary networks of distribution and dissemination for recordings. To give an example, and you, there are almost innumerable examples such as this. Pauline Oliveros is a composer whose work is currently available on dozens of commercially released recordings, but before 1970, her music was represented exclusively by contributions to two compilation albums. And uh, one of those pieces is shorter than four minutes. It's a tiny, tiny excerpt. By contrast, to celebrate Oliveros's 80th birthday in 2012, Important records released reverberations, a 12 CD collection containing more than 10 hours of largely unreleased tape and electronic music from the 1960s, beginning with the 1961 work of Music Concrete, uh, utilizing recordings made in her bathtub. The task thus emerges to articulate the conceptual distance between the creation of this music in the 1960s and its historicization and consumption in the present. And I'll just say parenthetically that I feel that this book uh, is set in two different periods. It's a, it's a book about music of the 1960s as it's accessed it, at the present moment. And, and it's, it's a book about the ways in which cultures of listening uh, separated by 50 years are profoundly different on the basis of, of the centrality of recordings nowadays. The majority of these recordings currently in circulation were initially made available as archival releases, surfacing years or decades after their date of recording. The first small waves of these archival releases appeared on LPs in the 1970s and 1980s. A more significant number of releases occurred in the late 1980s and throughout the 1990s, owing to the economics of compact discs, 
which were inexpensive to produce and which sold for a higher list price than LPs. In the 1990s, nearly every genre of music saw the introduction of reissue labels that specialized in repackaged and remastered releases of out-of-print recordings. This fueled an interest in unreleased archival recordings, and experimental music of the 1960s proved to be a particularly rich, varied, underexplored, and from the perspective of numerous record labels, underexploited trove. The flood of archival releases on compact discs in the 1990s, and at the time it seemed like a flood, has since been eclipsed by the number of archival recordings that are available online, whether as purchasable digital files or especially as files made available for streaming or download free of charge through such online resources as UbuWeb, archive.org, and countless fan sites and MP3 blogs. And I also will interrupt myself here to say that the final chapter on this book has to do with the changing nature of the category archive on the basis of online resources such as UbuWeb or archive.org that historically an archive has been uh, you know, a physically delineated space that, that separated an earlier cultural moment from a present moment, right? An archive is, uh, establishes a kind of boundary, right? What's in the archive is not of the present. And in fact, the present is de sort of defined by what's excluded uh, and what, what's in the archive. But uh, in increasingly, as the category archive uh, uh, melds with, with a more general category like online resource, I, I think that the very nature of the category of archive is undergoing a change. The cost of schooling oneself in the more esoteric music of the 1960s and doing so with access to a vastly greater range of materials has plummeted to nothing. Consider the example of recordings of performances by the percussionist and live electronic music pioneer Max Newhouse. It used to be that if you were interested in Newhouse's realizations of music by Cage, Stockhouse, and Silvano Bussati, Earl Brown, and Morton Feldman, you would have had to pay dearly for an out-of-print copy of his LP Electronics and Percussion, Five Realizations from 1968 on Columbia Records' Music of Our Time series. It's a marvel that Newhouse's work was even represented on a major label. Surely this uh, ranks as one of the most abrasive and dynamically extreme records ever released by Columbia. Electronics and percussion remained out of print until it was reissued on compact disc by Sony Japan in 2003, and thus could be had a bit more cheaply than a vintage copy of the original LP. In 2003 and 2004, Archival releases of previously unissued performances by Newhouse appeared on three separate compact discs released by Al Gamargan, an Italian record label that specializes in archival editions of avant-garde music. The result is that instead of there being only a single recording of pieces by Cage and Stockhausen on the original electronics and percussion LP, suddenly there are separate, complete CDs dedicated to six versions of Cage's Fontana mix and four versions of Stockhausen's Zyklus. Listeners can now experience an hour's worth of New Newhouse's performances of a single piece. And I think this is uh, extremely important for uh, conceptualizing the relationship between indeterminate music and recordings, being able to compare multiple realizations. One can imagine that for John Cage, that wry, voluble detractor of LPs this would have been a preferable form for a, for a commercial release. Multiple iterations of a single indeterminate composition showing how the piece varies from performance to performance. Given Newhouse's employment in Fontana Mix feed, which we'll listen to in just a second, of contact microphones, loudspeakers, percussion instruments, and crucially of feedback, these realizations were fundamentally shaped by the physical environment in which they took place. Newhouse explains, and this is a quotation from Max Newhouse. Although the execution of the score is identical in each of these performances, the actual sounds that make up each realization are completely different as they're determined by which percussion instruments are used, the acoustics of the room, and the position of the mics in relation to the loudspeakers and the instruments at each specific moment. The factors here are so complex 
that even if the piece were to be performed twice in the same room with the same audience, the same instruments and the same loudspeakers, it would have completely different sound and structures each time. It seems something alive. the time that Alga Morgan issued its three CDs of New House's performances, Kenneth Goldsmith's online resource UbuWeb posted MP3 files of the Columbia Electronics and Percussion LP, and the album has been available for download in that form for nearly a decade. It's still available. You can be downloading it right now. Thus, in a few short years, New House's solo percussion and, alive, and live electronics work went from being represented to a listening public by two LPs that had been out of print for more than three decades and available only periodically at exorbitant prices, to many times that number of recordings, including, importantly, multiple realizations of the same composition, some of which are available at no cost to the listener. Max Newhouse presents us with just one of numerous examples of an artist whose work was represented by a scant few commercially released recordings in the 1960s if their work saw a release at all in that decade. When asked recently about experimental music on record in the 1960s, composer Tony Conrad reached back across the decades and provided valuable context. Quote, LPs or 45s or whatever were so removed from my worldview in the early 60s that they were irrelevant. It was almost a miracle in that sense to find that an actual LP of Stockhausen came on the market or that an LP of Ali Akbar Khan came on the market. Today, see, that seems very quaint, but at the time, it was really fascinating." End quote. Conrad recalled owning recordings of Arnold Schoenberg's music that appeared on dial records in the early 1950s, as well as hearing, but not owning Robert Ashley's The Wolfman which was released by the journal Source, Music of the Avant-Garde, on a 10-inch disc in 1966. Emphasizing the scarcity of experimental music on record, he concluded, quote, most of the recordings that I became involved with, with 
and that I cherished were pop music recordings that had to do with just what was on the radio. I found that stuff initially very hard to like. It was a big challenge to like easy listening. That was probably the hardest thing that I ever overcame. In a specific sense, I set about that effort to learn to like this or that in response to my reading, in quotes, of John Cage. I have the privilege tonight to be talking to a composer who needs no introduction, Mr. John Cage. And that fragment of the piece you just heard was part of the beginning of the mix with Ari, which the rest of which we'll get later. I thought it'd be very unfair and put you, well, sort of on the spot now, Mr. Cage, at right at the opening by quoting two recent comments on your music. The first comes from of all persons, writer Norman Mailer, who in his article of, on the Sonny Whiston Floyd Patterson Five Whole Places had this to say, and I quote him. I had a moment of vast hatred then for that bleak, gluttonous void of the establishment, that liberal power at the center of our lives, which gave jargon with charity, substituted the intolerance of mental health for the intolerance of passion, alienated emotion from its roots and man from his past, cut the giant of our half-wakened arts to fit a bed of Procrustes, Leonard Bernstein on the podium, John Cage in silence, offered a national art center, which would be to art as canned butter is to butter, and existed in a terror of eternity, which built a new religion of the psyche on a god who died, old Dr. Freud, of cancer. Well, that was only Miller. The next is from an article by teacher and critic Michael Steinberg entitled Tradition and Responsibility. And this article appears in the New Perspectives of New Music. And I quote him, The rise of music that is totally without social commitment also increases the separation between composer and public and represents still another form of departure from tradition. The cynicism with which this particular departure seems to have been made is perfectly symbolized in John Cage's account of a public lecture he had given, and Steinberg quoted. Later, during the question period, I gave one of six previously prepared answers, regardless of the question asked. This was a reflection of my engagement in Zen. <coughs> and Steinberg Cage coughing. While Mr. Cage's famous silent piano piece of his landscapes for a dozen radio receivers may be of little interest as music, they are of enormous importance historically as representing the complete abdication of the artist's power. I wonder, Mr. Cage, what is this all about? It seems to me that we are all moving in many directions at the present time, and that each one who is conscientious in his work and in his life must answer for himself the question why he does what he does. A number of musicians that I've spoken to about this project acknowledged with reluctance the fact that much of their musical activity in the 1960s would be known through the medium of recording. I repeatedly heard that this was not the spirit in which the music was made, nor in which the recordings were undertaken. Instead of being the most important outcome of musical activity, recordings were often made for hire, as documents of group dynamics or of fleeting encounters, as a means of getting gigs, and perhaps eventually to sell at gigs. Keith Rowe, longtime member of the British free improvisation group AMM, summed up, quote, I think we took that quite seriously as an AMM idea, that recordings were really undesirable, end quote. If composers and performers in this period tended to hold sound recording in low esteem, John Cage set the standard for antipathy toward commercially released recordings of musical works. Cage's disdain for records was legendary. He claimed not to have any in his home and repeatedly spoke of the ways in which records were antithetical to his work. In 1985, he told an interviewer, quote, I don't use records, and I give the example of someone who lives happily without records, end quote. He went on to describe records as, quote, destroying one's need for real music. They make people think that they're engaging in a musical activity when actually they're not. 
Cage's position can't be written off as the irritable affectations of an older composer. On January 17, 1950, he wrote in a letter to Pierre Boulez, quote, I'm starting a society called Capitalists Incorporated so that we will not be accused of being communists. Everyone who wants to join has to show that he has destroyed not less than 100 discs of music or one sound recording device. Also, everyone who joins automatically becomes president." End quote. Cage's disparagement of records is complicated by a number of basic facts about his career. He was one of the first composers to work in the medium of mag magnetic tape. He was an early and influential theorist of tape opening up a total field of sound. In the performance text, 45 Minutes for a Speaker from 1954, he notes, quote, the most enlivening thing about magnetic tape is this, whether we actually do it or not, everything we do do, say what we're doing, is affected radically by it. He was a pioneer of using records and performances. He participated in recordings of his works, both as a performer and as a supervisor. And even after his death in 1992, his works are sufficiently amenable to the medium of recorded sound to make him one of the most widely recorded composers of the 20th century. On the one hand, Cage's opposition to the fixed form of the record, the tedium of the medium, couldn't be more straightforward. It's the expression of a pioneer of works that are indeterminate as regards performance, works that on the basis of their design change significantly with each iteration, except when instantiated in the form of a recording. One fundamental objection, records don't change. Cage viewed sound recording, the revelation of magnetic tape for him being the potential of working with all sound, and records as objects, as commodities, and above all as fixed representations of musical works as fundamentally different entities. For Cage, magnetic tape and commercially released records served a shared purpose only when treated as a means of manipulating sound. Later on in this book, we'll see what Derek Bailey meant when he said in an, in an interview, quote, Recording's fine if it wasn't for fucking records. It's difficult to imagine Cage expressing himself in precisely these words, although the sentiment might have been much the same. But one also would have expected Cage to acknowledge the potential embodied by the record as a medium of communication across geographic distances to say nothing of time. Cage was an exceptional, tireless correspondent and a cheerfully committed internationalist who maintained a vast network of contacts. This is the person whose second collection of writings, A Year From Monday, is dedicated, quote, to us and all those who hate us, that the USA may become just another part of the world, no more, no less. Cage demonstrated his dislike of records and his contention that his work is antithetical to the form of the record in an instructive written exchange in March 1967 with Wesleyan University Press's production editor, Raymond Gramela. Gramela's proposed cover design for A Year From Monday, which is right here, found in the, the Cage archives. This is the rejected cover design because it looks too much like an LP. In a letter to Cage accompanying the mock-up, the designer explains, quote, as you can see, I'm alluding to music and sound by having the graphic design suggest a record jacket. Quote, Cage's response couldn't be more characteristic. Quote, I can see that the jacket design is interesting, but I think the direction taken is not in the spirit of my work, which is relatively speaking asymmetrical and unfocused. This would work for Lamont Young. I would like, seriously, the book title, the line, new lectures and writings by, and my signature printed boldly in three different typefaces, preferably over a map of Mexico or a calendar for the, for the year 1967 or eight or 1972, the end of the present critical period, or 2000. Records may not change, but they do travel. The record allows for the distribution of organized as well as disorganized sound. The record, unlike the conventionally notated musical score, presents itself as the dream medium for the type of individuals 
that the British composer Cornelius Cardew described as, quote, people who by some fluke have escaped a musical education and have nevertheless become musicians, i.e. play music to the full capacity of their beings, end quote. The record is the medium where the dichotomies of musician and non-musician and professional and amateur lose force, except when reasserted for the frisson of crudeness, for reveling in the status of the profoundly amateur or the strikingly non-musical. However, lest the preceding quotation would you, lead you to believe that Cardew himself was writing appreciatively of sound recordings, note that later in the very same essay, he writes regarding improvisation, quote, documents such as tape recordings of improvisation are essentially empty as they preserve chiefly the form of something uh, that something took and give at best an indistinct hint as to the feeling and can't of course convey any sense of time and place. From the perspective of a number of composers and musicians from this period, it could well seem that, as in the excerpt from John Ashbery's prose poem, The System, which provides this book's epigraph, quote, the rejected chapters have taken over. Recordings that were not previously central to the tale have increasingly become the content of the telling as well as the medium by which it's told. The angel that in Ashbery's poem has, quote, begun to dominate the whole story, stands revealed as the recording angel, and, quote, the resulting mountain of data that threatens us, end quote, seems at present self-explanatory. Thank you. <laughs>